Well, here we are again to uh, look at our lesson. Today we're talking about the promises of God. Um, this is a, a subject that I covered in about uh, 15 or 20 weeks with the congregation, uh, but I'm going to try to cover, uh, in general, uh, a shorter version with you today. If you don't lose count, there are about 5,000 promises from God in the pages of Scripture. Obviously, we're not going to cover all 5,000 today, uh, we're, but we're going to cover a few. Uh, 2 Peter 1.4 actually describes them for us. It says, God has given us great and precious promises that by these uh, you might receive uh, and understand the inheritance that you have waiting for you in eternity. So today we're going to explore some of the foundational truth. And here's the, the foundation of everything I'm going to talk about today. God always does what he says he will. Sometimes we want God to do it on our schedule. doesn't work that way. He does it on his schedule but he always does what he says he's going to do. Those are his promises, and they are, I'm going to describe them in terms of three or four categories uh, so that we can deal with those today, and I hope that you will uh, find that helpful. Let's talk first about the promises of God that are related to the vicissitudes of life. That's not a word that we use very often. Uh, vicissitudes includes anything that, that we struggle with, anything that's difficult for us uh, in, in our lives on a day-by-day -day basis. Uh, and one of the promises, the first that I'll look at, is what, how God blesses us or helps us in times of trouble. Uh, he shall deliver thee in six troubles, Yea, in seven there shall no evil touch thee, Job 5.19. Now, that's Job, by the way. We know that a lot of evil, what appeared to be evil, at least in Satan's plan for Job, it was evil, uh, touched life, touched Job's life. But in the end, God fulfilled his promise. And you'll find a similar thought, I'm not going to read all of the verses, in Psalm 9.9. Psalm 34, 17, uh, Psalm 107, Psalm 138, and in John 16, uh, where Jesus is talking to his disciples uh, on the night before his death. Another one of the vicissitudes of life that we're looking at in this section of the promises is disease and famine. Uh, the psalmist says, they shall not be ashamed in the evil time. In days of famine, I will satisfy them. Psalm 37, 19. And you find a similar reference in Isaiah uh, chapter 41 and Zechariah chapter 10. We live in times of struggle with diseases that are new to us, with famine conditions in people's lives. You will see uh, if you watch the television uh, frequently, you'll see people driving up to food banks or to distribution of boxes of food because they're in need. There's a famine. Uh, more important, there's a famine of righteousness and a famine of uh, decent living. Uh, and I think in all of these, God speaks to us and says, if we trust him, we'll not be ashamed. Then we mention financial struggles. Uh, For the needy shall not always be forgotten, Psalm 9, 18 says, and Psalm 69, 33, Psalm 132, 15, and James 2, 5 also mention this thought, that God will bless us and take care of our needs. My dad's favorite verse was Philippians 4, 19, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God has promised 
to take care of your needs, not your wants, but your needs. So trust him for that as he speaks to us. There's also a promise about isolation in our lives. Loneliness is man's temporal uh, terminal illness, I should say. Uh, the only thing we can't do with anybody else is we can't die with them. We die alone. But God has promised in his word that he doesn't leave us alone. In the uh, book of Psalms 68, verse 5, he says, God is a father of the fatherless, a judge of widows. And so he reaches out to those who have special need of relationship uh, because they're feeling isolated and comforts them. One of the verses in the Old Testament says, God is a husband to the widow. God reaches to us at the point of our need and blesses us by giving us the solace of his presence with us each day as we walk with him. God also remembers that we are not only lonely at times and isolated, but that we need special relationships in our lives. In Psalm 68, 6, he says, God setteth the solitary in families. And God blesses us with relationships that are good for us. And not all relationships are good because sometimes we are people who are disturbed and don't treat each other well. But it's God's intention that the family be a place where you find refuge and solace in your life. And so he says, he sets the solitary, the lonely in families. And then God says, we're blessed when we have evil words spoken against us and slanderous language in Matthew 5, 11, and 12 in part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He says, blessed are you when men shall revile you and say all manner of evil about you for my name's sake. Now, he, he doesn't say you're blessed if people don't like you and they call you nasty names because of your behavior. He says if they give you evil words for his name's sake, he will bless you and will work through those things with you. And that same thought is in Psalm 37, Isaiah 6, 1 Peter 4. So there are lots of reiterations of that promise in the words of Scripture. Then there's a promise about injustice and oppression. Uh, Psalm 12, 5 says, I will set him in safety. God wants to bless you and keep you safe in life. And as long as you don't make bad decisions that put you in danger, uh, that promise will be fulfilled. And sometimes when you make bad decisions and you're in danger, he fulfills the promise anyway because it's re reiterated in Psalm 72, Psalm 146, Isaiah 54, and so on throughout Scripture. God wants you to have the best that he's planned for you in, his, in your life. That's his promise to you. He wants you to experience fullness, joy, hope, satisfaction. All these come with being safe in your lifestyle. Then we look at another section of the promises, and these are about conflict. David said, And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies, Psalm 27, 6. And also God gives us examples of how he gives victory to those who are his own in 2 Kings 17, in Isaiah 54, and again in the Gospel of Luke chapter 18, verse 7. Uh, God wants to help you, bless you, strengthen you, let you rise above conflict with your enemies if you trust him. And so that's his plan. 
And finally, the last one about the vicissitudes of life is war. God says in famine, or the scripture says in famine, he shall redeem thee in war from the power of the sword. Again, that's Job 5, Deuteronomy 20, 2 Chronicles 13. God doesn't want you to be defeated in your life physically or spiritually. Now, the power of the sword, of course, is a limited concept because that was the weapon of choice uh, in that day when the scripture was written. Uh, God protects us from many difficult things. And in our day, perhaps we would say it's riots or it's a pistol or it's some other ingredient of terror or war. But God wants you to be safe. And so he makes that promise to you about the difficulties of life. Now, the second section of promises uh, that I want to mention for you today uh, includes five areas. The first one is the general promises of God related to material blessings in your life. The Lord will give grace and glory. No, will, no good thing with, will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. So the book of Psalms 84 to 11 says, the same thought is repeated in Psalm 5, in Proverbs 10 and 12 and 21, and Romans 8, 32. God intends for good in your life. Romans 8, 28 is one that we all know. All things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. It doesn't say that all things are good, but it says that all things work together for good when you trust God. So God's intention toward you and his promises about you are that he will give you good things in your life and will not withhold anything good if you walk uprightly before him. He also says that he will take care of your daily needs and my daily needs. But that happens when we trust in him. Trust in the Lord and do good, and thou shalt be fed, Psalm 37, 3 says. The same thought is repeated in Proverbs 13 in Matthew 6, 26. And there, God reminds us that Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of the lilies of the field. And he says, if God so clothed the grass, which is now and is thrown into the furnace later, how much more will he care for you? Will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? So God intends to bless you and take care of your daily needs if you allow him. It's good to also know that God gives you a promise about your safety. I will lay down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, makes me to dwell in safety. Psalm 4, 8 and Psalm 120, 112, 7. There are lots of folks who uh, suffer with sleeplessness, with anxiety in the night. And David said, if you trust in the Lord, he will give you sleep and he will keep you in safety. Now that wasn't always true for David because there are many Psalms in which he talks about being restless in the night and talking to God about the things that are bothering him in the day. But God intends for you and me to have safe sleep and that's good for all of us who occasionally have to take something to help us sleep. It's not God's intention. He wants you to have peace and sleep. And then God wants you also to have supply and success in your lives. Commit thy way unto the Lord and trust also in him, Psalm 37, 5 calls. Psalm 1, 3 and Isaiah 65, verses 21 to 23 also talk about the connection between committing your life to God 
and allowing him to supply all of your needs and to make you successful in terms of God's blessings in your life. And finally, under material needs, uh, the verse I mentioned a little earlier, my dad's favorite verse was Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all your need by Christ Jesus, according to his riches in glory, by Christ Jesus. I watched my dad fulfill that promise so many times as I was growing up and as I was a teenager and a young man. My dad was not a wealthy man, but I never saw him turn anyone away who was in need. And God supplied his need because we never had a day that we didn't have something on the table to eat and he took care of all of our needs. And my dad believed it was because of that promise of scripture. I hope you will learn that truth and you'll be blessed as well. Deuteronomy 28, Psalm 112, and Proverbs 15, 6 reiterate that promise to us that God wants to supply all of our needs and he wants us to be what we've come to call successful but he wants us to be fulfilled. He wants us to be completed in our tasks in life. So we've talked about the promises of God related to the vicissitudes of life. We've talked about the promises of God related to the material blessings in life. Let's talk about the promises of God related to the spiritual blessings in life. It begins for us with faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, aren't you glad that that's where God starts with us? He gives us the gift of faith so that we can trust in him and receive his grace. Uh, it also helps us to know that God promises to forgive our sins. I love this verse, Hebrews 10, 17. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. When you think about your sins, let go of your past because God has. When you come and you say, Lord, forgive me for what I did when I was 16, God says, huh? Because he's already forgotten. He doesn't hold that against you and he wants you to let go of it and to experience his grace that's psalm 103 jeremiah 31 34 micah 7 16. be thankful that there are some things that god forgets you may not always forget them but he does another spiritual blessing is that God gives us an openness to prayer. Hebrews 10 says that we enter with boldness into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. You know what he's talking about? In the Old Testament, in the tabernacle, there was a gathering area outside in the larger part of the tabernacle where everyone could come and where the priest would go into the first room uh, in the tabernacle and offer sacrifices so that the sins of the people might be forgiven. But once a year on the Day of Atonement, he went into the holiest of holies, the inner sanctum where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. Jesus opened the way to that inner holy of holies for us. And so Hebrew says, we come with boldness into the holiest place by the blood of Jesus Christ. He makes it possible. And then another gift that the that blessing that God gives us, a promise that's fulfilled, uh, is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus asked the people in Luke chapter 18, verses 13, if you're a parent and you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And then in the second chapter of the book of Acts, we have that description of the first Pentecost, 50 days 
after the resurrection of Jesus when the Holy Spirit came to dwell in all believers. So if you're a believer, if you've received Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit has come to live in you and to guide you in your spiritual development. And that same thought is, re, is reiterated in Isaiah 59, in Ezekiel 36, in John 7, and in John 14. And I hope that you'll look at the notes and take time to look up these scriptures and read them uh, either as we go through the lesson or after it's over uh, as you write down these words. It makes it possible for you and for me to be ready to pray and to be heard by the Father. And then another spiritual gift or spiritual blessing, a fulfillment of promise that God gives us is the answer to our prayer. Call unto me in the day of trouble and I will deliver thee. That's Psalm 50, verse 15. Isaiah 30 says something very similar in Isaiah 58. Isaiah is one of those books in the Old Testament that has so many counterpart references in the New Testament. Jeremiah 29, 12, and Matthew 7, 7 to 11, toward the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and 1 John 3, uh, verse 22, and chapter 5, verses 14 to 16, tell us that God wants to answer our prayers, that he's open to hearing our prayers and granting us the blessings that we need in each day of our lives. It's his promise, and he always does what he promises. You can count on that. All right, and then God gives us guidance. He promises that. James 1.5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who liberally giveth to all who ask wisdom. That kind of guidance is available as you grow in your spiritual life. Psalm 32, 8 has a similar uh, thought. Proverbs 2, 6, 1 Corinthians 12, 8. And Psalm 37 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. We don't always plan our steps in a way that are, is going to guide and is going to uh, allow God to bless us. But he directs our steps and sends us in the direction that we're going to be blessed. And that's true when we face temptation as well. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, God is faithful. He will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Aren't you glad that no temptation comes your way that God won't help you to deal with and overcome. It's his promise. And the final one I want to mention about the blessing in spiritual growth areas is peace. The peace of God shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, Philippians 4, 7 says. Psalm 119, Isaiah 26 John 14, 27, all repeat that peace that God wants to give. You remember Jesus said to his disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, but I give it to you so that you will know that my Father has given you that peace, and so have I. So those are the promises of God relating to spiritual blessings. Let's look at one other section about the promises of God. The promises of God related to spiritual growth continue, but have to do with specific things that God wants to develop in our lives. First is a forgiving spirit. Jesus taught us something that's very difficult to live up to when he said, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. That was in the beginning section 
of his Sermon on the Mount, as we call it. It's also repeated in Mark 11, in Luke 6, and in 1 Peter 3, 9. God wants you to forgive as you have been forgiven. He taught us to pray, not to say these words in a recitation every week of the year, but to pray, forgiving others as you have been forgiven. So one of the special gifts in spiritual growth that God wants to give to us is a forgiving spirit. Then he wants to give us purity. Again, looking at the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, chapter, verse 8, and in Psalm, 6, uh, Psalm 18, verse 26, and in Psalm 73, he gives us this thought, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It's difficult in the world in which we live to remain pure. There are obscenities, pornography, all sorts of difficulties, uh, illicit behavior, people toward each other. God wants to give you purity and from your purity of heart to open your eyes to see him. Another gift, spiritual gift, as part of our growth that God wants to give us is humility. His command is humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. You'll find this in 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, verse six. Also similar in Psalm 138, Matthew 18, and James 4. Humility is not weakness, nor is meekness, which is the next category we're going to look at. The Bible says the meek he will guide in judgment, Psalm 25, 9, and in Psalm 149, then Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 3. The humble person, the meek person, is not a person who gets pushed around by everybody. Meekness or humility is in knowing what God has called you to do, what you're capable of doing, and doing it. Not feigning inability so that people will beg you to use your gift or to do something that they know you can do and you know you can do. And when you say, I can't do that, I can't talk, I can't. You remember all the people in the Bible who gave God that excuse? He said, no way, Moses, I'm going to give you Aaron. And Aaron was a thorn in Moses' side all the way along. And Jeremiah said, I'm just a child. I can't speak. And God said, I'm going to send you to the nations and let you speak to them. Use your gift. Use your talent. Use your ability. Whatever it is, God gave that to you. And the humble person is the one who uses his talent and allows God to bless him in the process. And finally, I want to mention the spiritual growth that we might call contrition or repentance. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, Psalm 51, 17 says. Isaiah 57 repeats that thought, Isaiah 66 as well, and Matthew 5, 3. It's not just enough once in your life to repent. Now, it's true that when you come to God and you say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, that opens the door of your relationship to God so that when you repent of sin, you grow. And as God leads you and touches you, teaches me about my failures, my mistakes, I learn to repent and repentance keeps the doorway open between God and me so that I grow in this new intimate relationship that I have with him. And the final uh, spiritual growth gift is called endurance. And the Bible says, you shall be hated for, of all men for my name's sake, but he that endures to the end shall be saved, Matthew 10. 22. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 repeats that. 
Galatians 6, 9, Hebrews 10, 23. So God has promised that he will give us strength to endure throughout the growth process until we see him face to face. So the question is, finally, how do we treat the promises of God? Abraham's a good example. He believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Beginning with grace, which brings us salvation, we are to believe the promise, receive the blessing, and follow in the prescribed ways in order that God may fully bless us. Today is the first day of the rest of our lives. Let's live out these truths each day and life will be great. Every author, when he completes a book, feels kind of like a person who's given birth to a child. Um, and about three and a half months ago, I, I finished my latest book, which is called Living Without Limits. It's a book that includes several of the articles that I've had published in newspapers in North Georgia and in professional journals um, and other sources that have been collected along with new material that I've written uh, in this book. They're available at uh, Amazon and Bar Barnes and Noble and perhaps in your local bookstore wherever you are. They are the increasing uh, group of titles that I've written. Uh, my bestseller is called Try Marriage Before Divorce, 30 Days to a Happier Marriage. This is a book that I've talked about in various conferences and opportunities to speak in churches and colleges, whatever. And I have said to people who've listened to me, if you try the 30 days that are in this book, and they don't help your marriage, just send me a note and I'll refund your money. Well, this is uh, 1977. I've yet to get a letter uh, asking me for a refund. So if you want to improve your marriage, try it. And if you want to improve your financial life, uh, the next bestseller on my list is called Getting More Family Out of Your Dollar. It's one that offers uh, a guideline for parents uh, with their children and with their own budget uh, so that it becomes helpful in your daily life. Just one of the kinds of things that I like to do uh, as an author and a writer. I hope you'll enjoy them. Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises, standing on the promises Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing on the promises, standing on the promises. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord. Bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord. Overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises.
purposes of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God.